Rising. Thanks for kicking off the week with us. Hello, Brianna. Hello, Robbie. How are you doing? It's good to be back. We had a uh, fun hanging out a little bit over the weekend. We did. And I think we're going to bring this. Uh... We finally recovered from it. <laughs> <laughs> to say, I was energized by the experience, Robbie. But yes, the recovery is over, and I'm, I'm ready to get back into the news. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, why don't you tell us what's going on? Well, Robbie, President Biden defended his controversial decision to send cluster munitions to Ukraine in an interview with CNN's Fareed Zakaria this weekend. Let's take a look. It was a very difficult decision on my part. Uh, and by the way, I discussed this with our allies, discussed this with our friends up on the Hill. And uh, we're in a situation where Ukraine continues to be brutally attacked across the board by munitions, by these cluster munitions that are, have dud rates that are very, very low, I mean, very high, that are dangerous to civilians, number one. Number two, uh, the Ukrainians are running out of ammunition. Uh, the ammunition that is, they call them 155 millimeter weapons. This is a, this is a war relating to munitions and uh, the running out of those, that ammunition, and we're low on it. Now, cluster munitions are known for their propensity to hurt civilians who disturb or mishandle unexploded mines even years after wars end. Civilians represented 97 percent of all cluster munition casualties in 2001. As reported by the Watchdog Group Cluster Munition Monitor, 40 percent of victims are children. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, this is very alarming. People are raising concerns that seem incredibly legitimate, um, including people like, so Jen Psaki, when what she was told, you know, back in 2022, that Russia was using these munitions, says, well, of course, this is a war crime. You know, this is something that many of our peer nations, the UK, France, and on and on, lots of them have said this is not, this is not compatible with, with um, the way a civilized country conducts war. Uh, we, the U.S., has not agreed to that, nor has Ukraine, so it, this is, we're not violating any promise, ostensibly, we've made. Still, this sounds like exactly the kind of dangerous, sh you know, very short-term thinking. Well, they need weapons now, so we give them these weapons that, um, that in my understanding of the, of the technical situation, is that there, then there are a lot of little explosive fragments that break off, and not all of those explode. Some of them become embedded in the ground and then can be stumbled upon later, yeah. days later, weeks later, years later. Um, you know, this is, this is how you turn a country experiencing a war into a permanent battlefield, into yeah. one that is always unsafe ground, like what we've done in the Middle East. Yeah, so the, the irony is, exactly as you point out, that Russia's use of cluster bombs was uh, evidence to many people who wanted to support unlimited aid to Ukraine and further the proxy war of why we needed to be involved in that particular conflict. It was evidence of how kind of evil Russians were and how uh, pernicious the, the kind of fighting particularly was. Now the tables have turned where many of the uh, leftists that I've seen pushing back against uh, the U.S.'s choice to send Ukraine cluster bombs are being told, well, you didn't care when Russia was doing it. Quite the opposite. You did care when Russia was doing it, and now you don't care that America is choosing to do it. And, and here's the problem. The, the, it's like you're, you're right to describe it as a bunch of smaller bombs inside of a large bomb. So it's very indiscriminate in the way they're launched. You're basically scatter, scatter plotting a bunch of small bombs, and many of them also failed to detonate. And we saw this uh, in, in nine years of bombing Laos. We dropped 270 million cluster bombs on the country. Every eight minutes, 24 hours a day for not, from nine years, from 1964 to 1973. And 50 years later, people are still being blown up by those bombs. And part of the argument that's now being made is that, well, our cluster bombs are different. They're safer. In the tests that we've done, we have many fewer of the bombs that fail to detonate. So it's much less likely that a child is going to stumble upon them in later years and pick them up and find themselves maimed or killed. But one thing to note is that the way we test our cluster bombs is on um, kind of these ideal conditions. Uh, uh, conditions on flat, hard surfaces out in the, you know, mm -hmm. desert uh, of the United States, basically, where they're much more likely to explode when they hit the ground, as opposed to in scenarios like in Laos or in where there's obviously jungle right. and soft ground or in Ukraine, where there's mud and vegetation and things like that. So we're also, I think, in the process of misrepresenting how dangerous these things are to come up with excuses for why it's OK when we do it. Well, and the, that whole right, that that's ridiculous on its face. Because what are we saying? Oh, no, don't worry. Those those bombs won't 
hurt people? <laughs> what do you mean? They're the bombs. That's, of course they will. Yeah. What they're actually saying is they won't hurt anyone unintentionally right. at some other point. That's laughable. We don't believe that. Right. Um, it's and so there. You know, Biden is framing this as um, necessary. The mainstream media all getting behind it as important in the short term because we're at this pivotal stage of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Is anyone persuaded by that? Does anyone think right now is a more pivotal stage in the Russia-Ukraine conflict than at any point before, or will it be any, like, I don't believe that. This is, it sounds like the exact same thing you would hear about why the surge is necessary in Iraq, yeah. or why, you know, we just need to stay the course for another year in Afghanistan because we're in the pivotal zone now, it's turning around, or we have to stop it from being reversed, or something. No, the reality is this is just a conflict that's going to go on for the foreseeable future until, until all of our will to do anything Anything about it is exhausted, and there's some kind of diplomacy where Russia probably gets something approaching exactly what it wants, or something. Maybe so hopefully something short of what it wants, yeah. and Ukraine deals with that, and then it ends. And in no amount of I don't believe I don't, does anyone really believe that any amount of weapons packages from the U.S. Yeah, is gonna is gonna end is gonna that's gonna be the final word on it. No particularly way. Particularly this kind of a weapon. The argument is what that what it takes to to win the war in Ukraine is deploying a weapon. A that indiscriminately which, kills your own citizens exactly, in the long run? <laughs> one third of all recorded casualties from this kind of weapon are children. Are children. Right. I mean, and this really, I think, underscores the point that many people have been making about how the cost of this war, I think, is being largely ignored. The prolonged nature of it is accruing costs separate and apart from whatever you think you're, you're, you're giving up in the context of a territorial dispute. Oh, people say, well, we can't end the war. Right. The, well, it'll be bending the knee to Russia. OK, but just so that you're being very clear eyed about it, the consequences when you're literally arguing that the war can't be won except for using weapons that disproportionately kill children is that, that that's a cost you're saying that you're willing to pay. Mm. Well, at, finally, at least, there is a cost. So far, Biden has said that he's not quite willing to pay in terms of Ukraine joining NATO. Here he is, uh, President Biden, making comments during a recent interview about why, for right now, he doesn't think Ukraine should join NATO. Should it get membership in NATO? I don't think it's ready for membership in NATO, but here's the deal. I spent, as you know, a great deal of time trying to hold NATO together because I believe Putin has had an overwhelming objective from the time he launched 185,000 troops into Ukraine. And that was to break NATO. He was confident, in my view, and many of the intelligence community, he was confident he could break NATO. So holding NATO together is really critical. I don't think there is unanimity in NATO about whether or not to bring Ukraine into the NATO family now, at this moment, in the middle of a war. Friend of the show, Glenn Greenwald, tweeted out in response to the interview, quote, the top priority of the bipartisan U.S. foreign policy establishment and CIA by far is fueling the proxy war in Ukraine. There's a grand total of one TV host in corporate media vehemently and vocally opposed to that policy, but then he got fired, so now there is none. Glenn obviously talking about uh, Tucker Carlson there. Um, on the, in terms of the Biden clip, I, I mean, it is good to hear him articulate that, well, they can't join NATO right now because we are committed to defend it. You know, we should keep our agreement, and our agreement is to defend the countries in NATO, so that would just put us in direct, instead of rather this proxy World, indirect World War, War, III. World War III. We obviously can't do that, so they can't join NATO. So I appreciate him saying that. I mean, that is like the bare minimum, most it's common sense thing you could possibly think. but. He does think it, so so there's that. What do you make? And we're going to talk more about um, Tucker Carlson in a in a future segment. He did a great interview with Russell Brand that we'll be um, dissecting a little bit. But what do you uh, make of Glenn's comment there? For, so for one, I think there is a longer history of um, anti-war news pundits that has been booted from mainstream news. So I would include people like uh, Phil Donahue right, and Lawrence Right, he, he did O'Donnell tweet about Phil, and, uh, Phil Donahue as well. Okay, yeah, so I, yeah, I would yeah. say that it, yeah. I would say it's much more ex inclusive of Tucker Carlson. I also personally, and this isn't Glenn's point, but I have uh, some concerns with the, the broader gestalt of the kinds of messaging and arguments that Tucker Carlson made on his show. So I'm less willing to say that we needed Tucker Carlson to be an anti-war voice and that that canceled out all the other mm -hmm. messaging, much of which I think was just not very truthful and wasn't genuinely invested in holding our political leadership accountable to doing domestic spending and doing 
uh, real economic justice here at home, as opposed to using some of these talking points as a as talking points to advance uh, the other parts of his agenda that I don't agree with. That being said. I do think it is very useful to do what Glenn is doing, which is to shame the ostensibly more progressive aspects of the media, parts of the media, for allowing Tucker Carlson, at least superficially, if only superficially and rhetorically, to get to their left on these kinds of issues, on this anti-war issue in particular. And they should be shamed in that way. And I think he's right to continue to bring up the fact that Tucker Carlson was the only one who would even give lip service to having an anti-war sentiment in the context of the corporate media. Yeah, and, and Glenn did in, in that same tweet thread bring up the Phil Donahue example, which is a, a great example if people aren't familiar. I was a big fan of Phil Donahue from his, his like, daytime talk show thing he had. He, so he had on a lot of... Um, what I liked about him is he clearly would learn something about the ideologies of the people he was interviewing. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was always very informed, the conversations he was having. He had great conversations with people um, like that I like from my own ideological bent that I learned a lot more about mm -hmm. and saw challenged in a very productive way, like Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he, w but he was clearly a very anti-war voice, and he was on MSNBC at the time of the Iraq War, um, ramping up. And even though he was, um, you know, he was like I think better rated than anyone else they had at the time, yeah. they canceled him because they were absolutely because they were too afraid of having like an anti-war voice at the time where the whole country yes. was about to get excited for the Iraq War, like it was the Super Bowl. Yeah, or something. and we'll see. We'll talk about it in the upcoming segment, but. You know, it's, it's debatable whether or not being an anti-war voice is why Tucker Carlson was let go, even if you acknowledge that sure. we are worse off for not having more anti-war voices on TV. Sure. Well, we'll talk about that more in a second. More Rising right after this.